Uh, welcome everybody to the industry panel. We've got an all-star lineup here today. Uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, briefly, and then I've got some hard-hitting questions uh, for these guys. So leading off, uh, we've got Wes Yeomans here on the far end. And Wes is an audit partner with Deloitte in Salt Lake City. Uh, he's assisted his clients with numerous public filings and is well-versed in GAAP and is IFRS certified. Uh, Wes received his bachelor's degree in accounting from Utah State and his master's degree in accounting from the University of Texas Art, uh, at Arlington. So let's welcome Wes. Give him a hand. <laughs> All right, uh, number two, uh, Christy Hogan. Christy Hogan is currently the controller at BioFire Diagnostics in Salt Lake City, uh, which specializes in diagnostic tests in the medical industry. I tried to find out more about it, but it was too complicated <laughs> for me to understand. Uh, but it's a more advanced test than the doctor just saying, ah, and uh, find out if you're sick or not. Uh, so Christy heads up the corporate accounting team and oversees all the reporting to the head officer uh, in France, the parent company. Uh, hopefully you get to go visit uh, on a frequent basis over there, nice. Uh, she received both her bachelor's degree and her master's degree uh, here at Utah State. Uh, number three, Bob Thomas from Jones Simpkins. Uh, Jones Simpkins is a local firm here in Cache Valley and he's a partner there and he's had over 22 years of accounting and tax experience advising clients in many areas, including manufacturing, professional services, healthcare, assisted living, agriculture, and construction. I'm sure the list is even longer than that. Uh, Bob received his bachelor's degree in accounting and an MBA degree uh, from Utah State. So let's welcome Bob. Uh, nice to have him here. And uh, last but not least, Mark Erickson. Mark Erickson is an audit partner uh, with Tanner LLC in Salt Lake City. So Mark uh, also took some time out from his career at Tanner and worked at the Securities and Exchange Commission for two years. Uh, and uh, we are glad to have him here. He received both his bachelor's and his master's degree from here at Utah State. So let's welcome Mark. Uh, thanks for being here. All right, so let's kick off some of these hard-hitting questions. So with my students, I see them a lot of them in the audience, uh, we talk about the accounting landscape and managers, investors living in a place called Gapland. And uh, Gapland is a pretty peaceful place. Unicorns, rainbows, that kind of thing. But uh, I've identified three kind of threats to Gapland. And uh, so there might be trouble brewing in Gapland. And uh, these are three. I Googled uh, a couple terms. One, accounting is dead. And the second term, accounting is doomed. So these were the, some of the threats out there or changes in the industry. So I just wanted you guys to, to comment on these. The first one is in Gapland, uh, there's a threat that we're all going to be replaced by robots. That technology is going to make accounting obsolete uh, and no more need for accounting students. Uh, they're not going to have jobs because of technology, data analytics, and the like. So I just wanted uh, each of you to comment on you know, the role of technology, how it's changing. Uh, is it going to reduce the need for accounting? And or kind of students, what kind of technology skills they should be getting uh, as their students. So Mark, you want to start out? Sure. Do you have a microphone for they can pass I can speak loud if you want. Uh, so it, it is, yeah, we, we hear a lot about that. Um, but it's interesting, if you look over history, this is not the first time this no. has happened. Uh, funny enough, when Excel first came out, uh, there, there were, you know, bookkeepers were going to be gone. And the bookkeeping industry would fall apart and, and, and there would no longer be any need for any of that type of accounting work. Obviously, that didn't come to, come to pass. Excel really only required a different skill level, and then those people that had those skills were able to contribute and, and have actually improved jobs with better pay. So it actually improved the workforce. It's, it's difficult to predict exactly how technology is going to impact the industry, um, but it will. There's no question. The technology is growing at a rapid pace, and a lot of the, I'm, I'm an audit partner, and so I operate in the audit field. Uh, a lot of the audit procedures, I think it's safe to say, will be replaced by automated auditing procedures in the not-too-distant future. But at the same time, I think those that have skills and can master the technology and then utilize it, it's, it their, their opportunities are only going to be enhanced. And the last thing I'll say is I'm, I'm reminded often by one of my coworkers that we're in a relationship business. And... Although the numbers are important and the procedures are important and the work that we, that we generate is important, 
it, we, we really are a relationship business and our clients depend on that and, and really uh, want that. So, okay. You don't all have to answer, just if you <laughs> want to, just grab the mic and speak away. I'll give an industry perspective. I think that might be a little bit of a different view than the public. Um, just by way of knowledge, I worked for a couple years in public accounting and loved it, and then I have been in industry for 16 cents. But I think um, as far as industry goes, there's a lot of ERP implementations, and so I will say a lot of the reporting that we do is automated by an SAP or an Oracle, but we need professionals that can organize data, that can interpret reporting, that can understand what the output means. And in industry, our customers are the people in the business making decisions. So that means that if someone needs to decide if they're going to put in a new production line, they need to be able to know what the costs are to build the line, what the output's going to be, and you might get a report out of your ERP, but you have to be able to interpret it and tell that decision maker what it means and help them make their decisions. So I would say, yes, lots of people have SQL skills and data manipulation skills, but it never replaces the thinking behind the reporting that you get. Anybody else from a tax perspective, maybe? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I might just add, you know, obviously we've, we've joked around long ago that it, it wouldn't be too far fetched for on your W-2s just to have a, a scan code that you could scan it in and it would file your taxes for you on the software. But really where I think we make a difference as accountants, advisors, CPAs is helping clients um, make decisions that are that are not just based on the numbers, but that you can identify things that aren't going to come by, come through the computer. But you know, if you should do a 1031 tax-free de tax deferred exchange, or or other things that you can make decisions on how much depreciation to take in one year, uh, things that a computer is not going to be able to decide for you. So I think the real advantage we can bring to bear is our expertise and our knowledge of our familiarity with our clients and what their needs and desires are. But I would also encourage you to, to seek out and find additional learning and, and opportunities and experience in software because that's invaluable as you can help your clients make decisions as to what software, to, so, software programs to implement and what, what's going to be helpful for them. Great. Okay. So the next uh, the next reason why accounting may be doomed is uh, in Gapland. At least a few years ago, it was a little more of a threat. Is that we had the threat of invasion from the IASB and IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. So uh, that has lessened a bit. Maybe that threat. So maybe you could comment on where do you think that's going long term? The SEC hasn't officially ruled that out, uh, although they've really slammed on the brakes a little bit. Do you think that would be beneficial to have one world order for accounting standards? Uh, you, what are the pros and cons of that? And what advice would you, you give to students now about how much about IFRS should they be learning as undergrads in addition to U.S. GAAP? Yeah, there, there's been a lot of discussion out there. There's been uh, most of the recent new financial accounting standards have tried to converge with IFRS but the two sides haven't been able to agree. So although the initial, um, you know, the initial announcement says that they'll be the same after the, some deliberation, some questions from the companies, they go and diverge and will have, you know, one standard for IFRS and one standard for US GAAP. So even though there's been this big push to converge, I think there would be uh, some benefit to it, but there's really a lot of challenges as well. IFRS is a lot more judgment based. And in the U.S., we just can't seem to be get uh, seem to get through the judgment. We say, well, what in this situation? What about that situation? What about this situation? Everybody wants to be the same. Nobody wants to be out on an island. So, in U.S. GAAP is still more prescriptive, uh, even though U.S. GAAP is still trying to get more judgment based. Uh, people haven't jumped on board and been accepting of it yet. So, the conversation's still there. It's still trying to converge, but we'll see how uh, how soon that actually happens. Mark, what do you think? You know, I I, I agree. I, it's the push was so hard when it, you know, in those earlier years. There's a part of me that thinks if it didn't happen then, it's not going to happen for a long time because it was it was just such a hard push. And um, 
everybody really felt like that was close, that we were on the verge of it happening, that they were going to converge. And then, and then it just didn't, didn't happen. So I don't know. My gut feel is it's not very close. Yeah. So do you, what's that? The metric system, we haven't quite gotten on board yet. I don't know what's wrong with us. So, uh, so do you think students uh, at this point in their career should spend time becoming familiar with IFRS? Like I teach intermediate financial accounting and there's a lot of gap to teach. And there's a lot of other stuff that, we could, that you could learn about IFRS. Do you think it's worth their time to get into some of those differences and understand them? Christy, what do you think? Do you report in IFRS? Is that right? I do. Yep. So I spent 14 years at Coca-Cola, and they were owned by a foreign parent based in Hong Kong. And then now at BioFire, we're owned by a foreign parent based in Lyon, France. So I have always reported in U.S. GAAP for bank covenants and then IFRS for parent company reporting. So I would definitely learn that. The, in my experience, the pension accounting can be quite complex. You guys probably know that if you're in your intermediate third class. And that's something that I've dealt a lot with in both GAP and IFRS. So it's helpful to know that. It's good to to study both, I think, even in industry. Yeah. Well, and even, even you know, local companies here in Utah, many of them, well, there are a lot that are owned by foreign parents. I mean, that's, it's, it's really common. And, uh, and, and even those that only have U.S. operations, for many of them, there's a desire to be a, more of a global company, and, and they certainly have their eyes on international growth. And uh, so I, I think I, it's certainly not a waste of time. For students to learn that, in my opinion, yeah. Well, yeah, I, was, I was just going to say as well. You you are going to see it in public accounting. It's probably not going to be on every client, but you are going to come across it, and it's not going to hurt to know at least the high level differences between some of the main key areas in, in GAAP and IFRS, at least at a minimum. So yeah. So Bob, do you think that uh, on a tax level, do you think we're going to see more harmonization of like tax laws across countries or? I don't know if we're seeing less because countries are trying to maybe play off each other and attract businesses. So what do you think the future is of kind of convergence in the tax world? Yeah, I think you'll see some and more of that is, I mean, we have even being based our worldwide headquarters here in Logan, but we, <laughs> we are one of the largest regional firms in the state. But um, anyway, back to the tax question. Yeah, I think there will be some conformity. I, we have, I have a client that I work with that has subsidiaries in Ireland, England, Australia, and, and so they have reporting requirements there from a tax perspective as well as from an from an audited financial statement perspective. And and there some of those countries, Ireland in particular, has tried to make themselves uh, appealing to uh, to to medical device manufacturers to be located there. And I think you'll see that as you know with the with the euro and other things as they try and conform across Europe. And I think the U.S. will be somewhat forced a little bit to, to follow suit, to be competitive and keep those industries here in the United States. Uh, okay, last last big threat. Uh, uh, there's a recent book. Uh, this is by a couple of, couple of accounting professors, and they've been on kind of beating this drum for a long time. Uh, but the name of the accounting book is actually called uh, the, the Death of Accounting. It's actually called the end of accounting. And uh, they note that on a, a typical balance sheet, only about 18% of the market value of the company is represented by the balance sheet. In other words, market to book ratios are on average about five or six. So a lot of the, the information that investors care about is not captured very well by the accounting system. So they provide some possible remedies and solutions. So what do you think about that? Should accounting, should the boundaries of accounting expand uh, to capture some more of that market value, or is that not really the role of accounting? Is that not really a threat? Yeah, that's, that's always going to be a challenge, right? That's been the debate that accounting is always looking in the past, and people are wanting to see what's in the future. You know, guidance is given to the street for public companies, but it, it does become very subjective. There's a lot more judgment involved because you're just dealing with estimates going forward. So uh, I think the accounting world is trying to change a little bit to factor in some of those things. The new Cecil model is trying to get what you think the losses will be on a go forward basis. 
Um, there's a lot of work around this new revenue standard. There's a lot more disclosures required around the revenue standard. So I think accounting is trying to go that way, um, but it still is difficult. It's always going to be inherently difficult because investors are always worried, well, what, what is next? What are you going to do going forward? And accountants really have a difficult role in, in trying to estimate that. So uh, I, know, I know it's trying to change a little bit, but I just don't know how much it'll ever really be able to change in that way. So. I could see us going to the route of, of trying to report some things separately. And I, I think you get that in the disclosure and your, your financials and whatnot. But, you know, I, I, maybe it's accountants inherently or we're precise. It's easy to, to report the historical data and it's hard to put our neck out there and, and project something that we might be wrong on and uh, have that come back to bite us. Yeah. So, Mark, it's kind of same question, but, uh, you know, part of the reason why a lot of this is not represented is because of conservatism in accounting. And uh, in the conceptual framework, it advocates for neutrality in accounting, at least conceptually. But the standards, of course, are written with a lot of conservatism in mind. A lot of people, when I was at the FASB, were very critical of, you know, that conservatism should not be part of the standards, that there should be kind of a symmetric recognition of gains and losses. So what do you think? Should we get rid of conservatism? Would that help, or does it have a role? and trying to stop maybe evil managers? You know, I, I think uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the financial statements that we have and, and the historical reporting that we use, I mean, it's, it's very entrenched. I mean, this has been around for a very, very long time. And financial managers and financial analysts and investors and all across the world have been looking and pouring through these statements for, geez, I don't know. You, you know when it started. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure that's one of your test questions. Long time ago. But uh, <laughs> tradition. Yes. Yeah. And and so it's when you have something that entrenched, I think it, it is boy, it is it is tough to kick that out and replace it. And even though you're right, there, there's not necessarily it's it's not fair value reporting. There's tremendous information that can be gleaned from from financial statements. Now, um, you uh, re regarding um, what was your question? Conservatism. Oh yeah, conservatism. Uh, conservatism is kind of a bias yeah. built into the financial statement that. So we so recognize losses a little more frequently than gains, or at least earlier. Yeah. I had a I had a fun experience when I worked at the SEC. Um, this was back in the late '90s, so right in the heat of the what we now call the internet bubble, and companies were going. All you had to do to go public was have a website and a dream of revenues, and you could do an IPO and and uh, your stock would take off. It was it was a very crazy time. But I had the opportunity to participate in, in a task force that was called the Earnings Management Task Force. And the chief accountant of the enforcement division gave a speech regarding earnings management. And he specifically called out cookie jar reserves was one of his big ticket items. And basically what that meant is that companies were being conservative, recording a bunch of accruals for you know, to put in the cookie jar in case things didn't go well in the future. That if their revenue slipped or their profitability slipped a little bit, well, then they could just reduce those reserves a little bit and pull from those reserves to keep a nice straight line, or not straight line, but nice incline, consistent incline of, of earnings. And he referred to that as earnings management. And we had the opportunity, we targeted specific industries and specific filings that had specific stuff. And uh, we um, ended up with quite a number of, of restatements. So the, back then, this is back in the late 90s, the SEC was very focused on this. So it, it is, we are conservative by nature, but financial statements can still be wrong. There's no question they can still be wrong. Just being conservative doesn't mean they're right. No. Uh, and, and I think the SEC will focus on that and will continue to, which will drive the, the industry as well. Yeah, I think with the, the focus Mark mentioned, that came out several years back that folks may still err on the side of being conservative and there are certain standards that require you to be a little more conservative than others but uh, you know that earnings management has largely gone away it gets beat up pretty heavily if, if someone's got a large reserve and there's not a lot of support for it uh, speaking of conservative though um, we had a, a company that wasn't well versed in gap they wanted to take a gain. They said, hey, we're going to win this case, and it's we're going to get $3 million. We said, well, that's great. Typically, you can't do that. If you could, and they'd already booked it. And we said, well, you know, if you could provide us the guidance, we're more than happy to take a look at it. 
And uh, they went and found, you know, if you think you'll have, if you think you need to record a liability, uh, it needs to be recorded uh, if you think there's liability out there. And they had crossed out the liability and wrote gain <laughs> and handed that to us as their uh, support. But anyway. Yeah, we don't teach that method right currently, but uh, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. That, uh, that sounds pretty good. Okay, so now, so I think I'm a little reassured now hearing the, some of the responses about if accounting's doomed. Uh, so put on your creative, uh, your creative hats for a second, and let's suppose that you guys are the king of gap land or the queen of gap land. So you're in charge, or tax, or tax land for that matter. And uh, so what would you do to improve gap land, the accounting reporting system, or taxes? Uh, you know, the Trump administration has just come out with some reforms. So in your mind, what kind of changes would you see that would be improvements on the current system? We'll let the queen go first. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or some complaints about the current system and maybe how you'd like to change it. Well, I've been out of public a long time. So I think f from my perspective, just wading through the required footnote disclosures when we're doing footnote prep, I mean, it's pretty easy to do a cash flow and, and an income statement and balance sheet. But to understand if you've had a new transaction, what footnote disclosures are required from an industry perspective, the footnote disclosure checklist is about this thick. So we always sort of struggle with that when you're not in public accounting on a day-to-day -day basis is interpreting those guidances. I think they could shorten that and make it a bit more user-friendly for the people who aren't in public practice. Okay. I would, I would definitely so say if they're ever going to pass a new standard, they have to get rid of three, for yeah. sure. <laughs> so if they want to pass one, you got to get rid of three. And from a, from a tax perspective, every time they talk about simplification, the code gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And, and, and you know, they, but I think with technology, you, you mentioned that a little bit earlier. I, my hope would be that we get a little more uniformity as far as reporting. We see that now with, with K-1s and 1099s and everything else that's reported as a deduction on one side, for example, and that it's picked up as income on the other. And I think there's been a tendency in the past for, in the tax world in particular, whatever you can get away with is fine. It, you can lie, steal, or cheat to get away with it. And, and I like the idea, I don't like more regulation, but I like the idea of hampering people from cheating the system and playing on a fair playground. Trust but verify. Yeah, okay. Wes? Yeah, I would just say keeping uh, some of the regulation in check and, and trimming down some of the standards. But, you know, the regulation as far as the PCOB uh, is good. They definitely have their place. They definitely needed to come into play. But uh, some, of the, some of the rules and regulations now I don't think are in the best interest of the investors per se uh, when they come in and take a look at an audit. Uh, if there's a finding on the audit, they'll deem it to be a, a failed audit. Um, there's no... There's no, nothing wrong in the financial statements. Uh, there's nothing wrong that would impact the users, but they'll deem that a failed audit and uh, make it very difficult, uh, you know, on the public accounting firms and even the company to go back and redo some of the work. Uh, so I would just say the regulation is good, but I think it always needs to be tempered when you get in a, the pendulum seems to swing back and forth. And I think right now, at least from the regulatory perspective, it's, it's pretty far to one side. So. Okay, great. So uh, thinking about your time uh, when you guys were students, uh, uh, so some advice to our students here. Uh, what would you have done differently as a student? Had you known all that you know now as a successful professional and you were starting all over again, uh, what would you have done differently as a student? Or what would, would you have done the same? Okay. Well... Uh, I would say, and I'd encourage all of you, and, and most of you, I think, I recognize a lot of you from Meet the Firms and being here on campus, but um, to get, do an internship and figure out if this is what you want to do the rest of your life is very helpful. Uh, when I went to I went to Utah State, and I remember walking up this very hill. I think it was so cold in the morning, 7.30 in the morning class, and my nostrils froze together trying to get up here to a calculus class. I'm like, how stupid am I? I would... I take later classes in the day than 7.30 a.m. in the winter, but that'd be one, one point of advice. Later classes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think 
do a little bit more career exploration. I graduated in accounting. The best thing I could find was I went down here to Mooch's on the cor corner of 4th North and Main. I think his wife took it over now. It's Nilo's. But anyway, it was Mooch's at the time. And I entrenched myself there and helped him do his inventory and just so I could get a little bit of accounting experience. Uh, my other experience, I think, has lent itself quite well to the accounting in industry, and that is I was a district sales manager for the local paper. And, and I think if you think that you're not out selling yourself and dealing with the public, you know, the middle word in CPA is public. It's public accounting, and you're dealing with, with people. And so I would, I would say take those opportunities to put yourself out there and, and to take those, you know, opportunities, awkward and uncomfortable as they are, to talk to people and put yourself outside your comfort zone and, and you know, be a salesperson. And, but, but also I would say to do an internship is, is very valuable. I didn't take that opportunity when I was in school. I started my first day on the job. I got picked up at my house. I didn't even go into the office. And I went out for a week-long audit in uh, Salmon, Idaho. And uh, it was an experience. So <laughs> It's a good place, Salmon, Idaho. I've been there. So I, I, I've thought about this a lot. Because um, now I come up here and I see how awesome it is and uh, what a great experience the students are having. I, my recommendation is just to slow down a little bit. Um, when I was here, I was so focused on getting done and finishing and going to work. And uh, you're going to have a lot of time to work. Trust me. you got a lot of years to work. Enough. you you, you got enough years. And so take, really enjoy your experience. And if it takes you five or six years or seven, that's okay. That's really, I mean, you've got a lot of time ahead of you. And I know right now some of you may be thinking, oh, no way, i got to get out. I, gotta, I really want to just get this behind me and get a job. And uh, I, that's exactly the way I, I felt, too. It just in hindsight, I wish I would have taken more time, slowed down a little bit, spent a little more time with the professors, gone up to their office, maybe got a little more mentoring from them, um, established better relationships with them. I, I just, I'd say just slow down a little bit and, and, and try to enjoy your experience as much as you possibly can. And I would say don't get a myopic view about what way your career can go. One of the best decisions I made was to take an opportunity in industry, and it led me to an international rotation for living in Hong Kong for a year. So I definitely would, if you're open to it and you get a great opportunity and you're not sure if you can do it, just say, say yes and do it. And be confident in yourself and, and be open to flexibility and where your career may take you. Because what you have planned in your mind right now as you're a junior or senior might turn into something even better than you could ever think of once you get out into the world and you start interacting with people. So I would just say remain flexible and open and, and work hard and, and don't pass up a good opportunity. Yeah, just to maybe add to that, I would say build your network when you're here. It's never too early to start building your network, and you'll be surprised how many folks the accounting world's relatively small, and whether folks stay in public accounting or go into industry, you're going to be coming across them throughout your time in your career. So, you know, it's never too early to start building your network up. Okay, good advice. Uh, so, uh, it, so think, I want you guys to think of maybe the best person that you've worked with. So the best, uh, either accounting or some other area, uh, kind of the most successful, one that you admire, and describe some of the traits uh, that make them such a successful person, or what you admired uh, about that person that make them a successful person in the, in the workforce. I've, I've really been privileged to work with amazing people. Um, you know, one, uh, my, my closest friend that I had when I was at the SEC, and that was a, a time of my life, I think, where... You know, I worked in public accounting for about four years and then, and then went and worked for the SEC. So it was a, a fairly defining time in my career. And he, uh, he was just a great mentor, and he spent time. I, I remember sitting in his office. He had been, he was older, had been a very successful CFO, had made a lot of money, and he was working at the SEC for fun. I mean, he, it was kind of a thing that he had always wanted to do. He didn't need the money. And that sounds like fun. And well, but for him, SEC. for him, interestingly enough, it was. I think it wasn't. But he uh, he loved it. But it was just it was a great opportunity to sit 
with him, someone who had kind of been there, a little bit older, had been very successful, and uh, he just shared a lot of advice. He spent a lot of time. I, you know, when you're working for the government, we I will say we worked hard. Um, not the typical what you envision when you think of a government employee, but definitely he spent a lot of time coaching and mentoring me. So I I, I certainly give him a lot of credit for uh, some really good career counseling, I guess. I, I would say, just thinking back on my career, I've had several that I would look to as inspirational uh, at work and outside of work as well in the community. But, uh, you know, thinking about work place, um, one of my former mentors, the thing that I, I appreciate about that person is they were always interested in me. I, I felt like when we got together and had lunches, they asked me more questions about me and wanted me to tell them about what I had going on than, and weren't so interested in not self self-centered that he was telling me all about himself and how great he was, even though I admired him greatly and looked up to him and, and I credit him for my opportunity to become a partner at the firm I'm at. And yet he took an interest in me personally, wanted to know my kids, my wife, our interests as a family. And, uh, and that was all outside of work. He didn't need to do that. Um, but he was a very, very excellent professional, uh, well-versed in the industry, well-respected. And I just felt that it was an awesome opportunity to work with him. And he's always very positive. Um, wasn't degrading, even though sometimes I, I messed up. And as accounting students, we all were perfectionists. We always want to get 100% on everything and do everything right. But we have to recognize that we will make mistakes. And I think his perspective was, it's OK to make mistakes. Just don't make the same one over and over and learn from it. And that's some of the takeaways I, I took from him was just to be positive and, uh, and always be interested in others and what they had to offer. And, and I appreciated that, even though you know we're a numbers-driven industry, but he made it personal. I guess I would add to that. It would be my current boss. She's the CFO at BioFire. And she told me a story that she was a CFO at a company called ZVAX. And they got some new leadership in, and they asked her to re-interview for her job. And she said that was such a blow to her pride, obviously. But she did it, and they ended up selecting her again for the CFO. And after that, she said, I had just lost my passion for the position because I was, you know, insulted that they made me interview for the job I already had. So about a year after I started working with her, we ran into the boss who asked her to interview for her job. And she was gracious. She gave him a hug. She asked him how he was doing, asked him how the company was, and they exchanged niceties. And I said, how can you be so gracious to him when he made you interview for a job you already had? And she said, because that's how I operate. And so I think I, I would add to to that and just say to um, be gracious, be kind, make everybody feel important and that they have value and a contribution and it takes you far because like Wes said, the accounting world's pretty small. So you just never know who you may be working with or running into again. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much more to add to that other than I, I would echo that. You see people all the time uh, will win new work periodically. You know, we'll have someone go out to bid and, you know, you need to be gracious at those times. Uh, you also need to be gracious, uh, you know, when folks leave. Sometimes you'll have someone who you think is great. They'll come in and, and ask to leave the firm. They've been there for a year and a half and you want to say, what are you what are you doing? You're, you're doing so well. You've got so much opportunity here. I don't think that company will be. Uh, you know, the best opportunity for all the things you've been doing. Um, but it is um, it is being gracious in all those times and just, just being uh, good with the people you work with. As Mark mentioned, it's a relationship business, building relationships with your clients, building relationships. And those are the people who have impacted me, the ones who, who do that well, because the numbers, um, you can find anyone to do the numbers, but it's uh, finding people to have those relationships and finding people to manage the, the, the employees and the folks that you work with and those who do that the best, those are the ones who uh, I admire the most. Great. Uh, I think we've got time for a few student questions. So uh, put your thinking caps on. You've got some, uh, some great human capital here. 
Let's do one of those microphones. So just uh, raise your hand if you got a question. Uh, for my students, I'm offering extra credit. Just kidding, I never <laughs> offer extra credit. That's not a thing. But uh, yeah, if you could say your name uh, and uh, let us know your question. I'm Stephen Barson, I'm an accounting major. And this question is more directly towards those in Air Force. Um, I nothing against Gap Land, and but I'd love to learn more about FRS land, um, whether it's public or private. And speaking for many of the students here, we probably want to learn more technical detail about it. But in maybe in the job market, um, how you report things internationally or domestically. Um, Maybe many of us speak another language as well. For example, I speak Mandarin Chinese. Um, maybe some others speak Spanish or um, other languages. So maybe what's the role in learning not just IFRS or GAP, but learning it in a different language on top of that? So Wes, big differences. Uh, how do you get certified? It says, it says, I saw it on your bio that you're certified. <laughs> He's a certified, so he's part of that invasion team, apparently. So, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I would say it's loosely certified. We had to sign off for a component in IFRS, and it was about 80 hours of e-learnings over the course of a week or so for me to do it. So it wasn't as exciting as it sounds. But, uh, that does sound exciting. <laughs> but as, as far as IFRS and having those language skills, I think it really just boils down to uh, on where you end up. There's plenty of places in the U.S., uh, you know, that would report or have uh, components here that report to a parent company and they would report an IFRS. Uh, if you're looking to utilize those language skills and it's going to be communicating with the parent, and that, that goes both ways, right? If you're working for a company that has international operations, whether the parent's international or whether the operations are headquartered in the U.S., as long as there's some international folks out there, there's opportunities to use those language skills. And then the other opportunities are, I was just out, uh, this this past week in France, doing an internal inspection for the Paris office, and one of the ladies who I had met before, she was living in Madrid and had lived there for the last 15 years, and she was actually started in the Phoenix office. So you know she had that interest that it sounds like you had, and she wanted to. She spoke Spanish. She wanted to go out and uh, go into the world a little broader than the U.S., and she ended up in Madrid for 15 years. So really, uh, you know, if you have that. Uh, background to go international or to work with international companies, I think you can put those to use even here or take those elsewhere if you'd like. Anybody else for another question? Another question? I, I have a question. Shoot. What, what are some things that each of you have found um, as far as what, what is it that you're looking for in students as far as skill and mindset for the firms in which you would recruit to? What, what are some, some things that you're looking for within students? Sure. So uh, one of the things, I, I do most of the recruiting for our firm here on campus, and the one thing we look for first is that they're at Utah State, right? So <laughs> Best qualification, right? Yeah. We, we do recruit elsewhere, but we actually have found that, uh, you know, just those that have, here, have been here in Logan are familiar with the weather as it is, um, been here through a winter, and I want to stick around here. That That helps us, but... You know, the first thing to get your foot in the door is probably your grades, your GPA, and, and it's not everything, but it does tell me that your ability to learn and understand new concepts and, and grasp those concepts. And But I've had great experience with those who have sought us out before, the, on, before we came on campus recruiting. So students that have made an effort to look us up, come down and visit us at our office, or and I'm happy to take anybody to lunch, I haven't missed many meals. Uh, you can t see that, but uh, you know, I, I like spending time and getting to know people. And those that have been the most successful are the ones that have taken a proactive approach and reached out to us far in advance of the on-campus recruiting and 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 meet the firms and everything else. So, I think uh, just uh, to add to that, I, I think this is kind of what Bob was saying is. You know, we, we really like to hire people that really want to work at our firm. And we recognize that our firm is, is uh, different. The, the experience and the opportunities and challenges are going to be different in some ways than, than they would have at Deloitte or one of the big four. And I always tell the students, I say, look, our firm is not the perfect fit for every student. 
and I clearly recognize that the same way I don't think a big four firm is a perfect fit for every student. And so I encourage students to really explore the opportunities that are out there and explore the different firms and try and get a feel of what it's like to work there and what the experience is like. And then when you decide where you really want to be and you have that nailed down, pursue it and really go after it, like Bob was saying. And because if, if someone, if we find someone good and, and it's obvious that they really want to work for our firm, we're, they're, they're going to be the, the first ones we're going we're gonna to reach out to. Great. Others? Characteristics of students you're looking for? Yeah, I've been uh, up here ever since I've been back. I started down in Dallas and then been back for 14 years, and I think I've been recruiting on campus the last 14 years. And I think the, the students kind of, to echo echo what Mark said, is, uh, you know, we're looking for students that want to that want to work at Deloitte, that are at the activities, that are being proactive. Obviously, the, the GPA is a baseline. But then we're working, looking for folks that we want to work with as well. When you're sitting in an audit room, it's a pretty small room. You guys, you're, you're in there for a long time together. Uh, you don't want to be sitting with someone you can't have a five-minute conversation with at a meet the firms. You want to send someone, sit, work with someone you can get along with and who'll be a good team player and who, who looks like they'll be a good fit uh, at the company as well as, as someone you want to put in front of your clients. Because uh, most of the time in your early years, you're the first interaction with the clients. You're the face of the firm with the clients. So we want to see uh, that you're able to represent the company well as you go out and uh, interact with the clients. Christine, anything to add? Well, we're not recruiting on campus, but I will say that when I hire people, someone who has an interest in being at, at the company that's done their research and someone with a passion for what they do, and that's easily conveyed in your enthusiasm in the interview. If you don't know much about the company, you really don't know the name of who you're speaking to, you're not engaging in an interview, you're typically not going to get the job. So. I think for me, it's just to feel that you have an energy about you and, and a desire to do well, and you know who it is that you're speaking with, and you have done some research on the company. That's helpful. Great. Another question? In the back over there. Within the accounting industry, what are some ways that you or your organization uh, try to encourage creativity or innovation? Creative accountants. <laughs> I'm, inter I'm interested to hear this answer. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the, the top of the heap uh, in the accounting industry, but uh, that's a good question. Well, actually, we talked about automation a little bit earlier and in innovation. Deloitte has actually spent, uh, you know, several million, close to 100 million in innovation. We actually just wrapped up an innovation challenge where some folks out of the Salt Lake office are headed down to our uh, Deloitte University to present their innovation. Uh, and we've had several different innovative tools that have come out. And they're being released periodically. Uh, we've got several with artificial intelligence where you'll load in all of the different contracts and it'll do a quick uh, query for all the key search terms. And then it can you can reload different contracts and it'll pull out all the key information. So, for instance, if you're looking at leases and trying to figure out the key terms and see if those are all the same rather than sit down and go through all the 100 page leases you can load load those in uh, there's just several different tools with with uh, reviewing journal entries we actually take every single journal entry that the client makes throughout the year and run that through a computer program and kick out all the journal entries of interest so we focus our procedures that way rather than just randomly picking uh, some random journal entries. So there's actually a lot of innovation at least going on on the audit side on how to audit smarter and how to move along with these uh, technological advances and make sure we're taking advantage of those. I would say from an industry perspective, a lot of times we'll meet with VP of production or a scientist or someone on the line and they may say, what is my output? What? How much does it cost me to make this part? If we source raw material from somewhere else, how much can we save? And what do we think that will look like in terms of cost savings to the customer? Or what is the life cycle of this product over the next five years? How much revenue lift can we get? Someone that's able to understand the questions of people who aren't accountants 
and they're able to go into the ERP system and maybe create a report or extract data that gives them the answer to that question is helpful and I think creative. A lot of times people that you're working with at the company don't know where to go to get the answers and you have to be able to interpret what they say and sometimes be creative on how to put together a report or interpret an existing report for them. So I think being able to do that having good communication skills and being creative on how you get the data, especially when it's a new company that's growing and they don't have long-standing data systems. You have to be creative about how to get that and maybe how to piece together information to get an answer. Uh, from a past perspective, obviously we have to be careful how creative we get. Um, <laughs> I always want to be, I tell my clients I want to be able to sleep at night, and they do too. Uh, but at the same time, we want to take full advantage of every opportunity we have. A uh, quick example, I had a, it was a husband and wife architectural firm that came to me. They said, holy cow, we made half a million dollars this year, and we don't want to pay taxes on it. What can we do? Or they were on track for that. And so we got innovative. We got creative. We looked at their situation rather than just a traditional IRA or 401k, we're able to set them up in a defined benefit plan, which uh, uh, given their age and, and they were the only ones really employed the company, we were able to put 230000 of that money in a retirement plan for them. And they were very grateful for, to me four or five years later when they were able to retire from their business and sell it and... Uh, and go do what they wanted to do in retirement and had several million dollars set aside. And, and we were the hero there we're, because we were able to become innovative and help them out. It's a great question. We, uh, years, several years ago as a partner group, we, we went through and um, kind of came up with our core values of the firm. We reevaluated what was critical to us, why we were doing what we were doing, and really uh, kind of nailed that down. And innovation was one of the core values that we felt needed to be needed to be included and so that is that is one of the core values in our firm and we it's you ha there's a couple of very key things that that have to keep that alive is one you have to talk about it all the time and two you have to truly have an open door policy where everybody across the board all team members feel very comfortable bringing ideas and it, it may be strategy uh, you know tax or audit type strategy maybe has nothing to do with that you know, we had a so one of the uh, items that came up in, in our firm recently is, you know, we, we, we felt like we wanted to get better at uh, showing recognition for things that people do and when they help out or do good things or come up with new ideas. And someone had, had become familiar with a software tool that's called uh, Motivosity that um, allows people to post different you know, thank yous and, and recognize different people for their efforts. And just something that simple, it's not, wasn't hard, but it makes a big difference. People really love to feel recognized and love to feel that their efforts have been noticed. And so, you know, that's just one example of, of, of an employee who, who said, who brought that to our attention is, hey, I'm familiar with this um, software that, um, that allows for recognition and it has some great reviews and, and you know has some 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 uh, it seems like it's a really good tool so we ended up putting it in but anyway you got to have that open door and be willing to listen and and really take all ideas and, and really consider them right it okay. sounds like we have time maybe for one more question okay my name is Derek Morales I'm a marketing student here um, Jim Quigley was talking about uh, work-life balance and at the same time, we know as young professionals, we have this, uh, this pressure to come in and perform and show that we're hard workers and show that we're willing to do what it takes. We hear a lot about the importance of putting our nose to the grindstone, how important the first 100 days are in showing our work ethic. Uh, what sort of advice do you have for young professionals navigating this, uh, the pressure to, to have a work-life balance, but also to perform at a very high level? Um. So one of our other core values is it's not work-life balance. We call work-life integration, because truthfully, I don't, I don't think there, I don't think balance is very realistic. It's, it's not going to be balanced. And but you can still have a life outside of work. You can have interests. You can have family. You can have a very enjoyable 
time outside of work. And that's what we hope all, all of our team members do, that they, that they have other hobbies, they have other interests, whether it be sports or art or music or whatever it is, that they have things that they're interested in and passionate about. It makes them more interesting people. Now, uh, you're asking this question in a bad week for me. So, uh, um, but the, 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 the way we have made it work in, in my family is exactly that work-life integration. There's times when I work really hard. And there's times when I go for long stretches of time not being home for dinner. And where I have very significant overtime hours in a week. And then there's other times this summer we, I, I took my family and we spent 18 days in, in uh, France and Spain and had a wonderful time. It was great. And I was able to do that and, and it, it worked out wonderfully. And so there's a lot of things we're able to do as a family and with my kids, participate in their, in their concerts and other things that they have going on, programs that maybe in, in other employment situations I wouldn't be able to do that. So for me, the reason it works is because I work hard, I put in the hours, cer certainly at certain times of the year, and I think uh, having a good work ethic is a key to success. But then I have the flexibility to, to enjoy my life outside of work and to, to uh, do really great things with my family. I'd agree with that. I don't know if there is a really a perfect balance. I would call it a blend. Uh, work-life blend and that is you know on the tax side obviously we have tax season we we tend to live from deadline to deadline but outside of that it's a, it's a nice opportunity to I can leave work early if I need to I've I have five sons and I've tried to instill in them the work a work ethic similar to what I I try and live but at the same time I feel like I have to be there to be part of their life and I can't instill that work ethic in them if I'm not ever present. And so I try to make an effort to be home with them and teach them how to work, but uh, also be involved with their lives. This last year, two of my youngest boys decided to play tackle football. And uh, one of the coaches was a guy I played high school ball with. And so as soon as he found out that my son was playing, he was on my, my doorstep wanting me to help coach. Well, that's four nights a week and Saturdays that we're coaching and involved with games. And so it, it's hard to, to balance that, but I've been able to make the time to do that, and I think it's important to make sure I make that time. But similar to Mark, you know, I, I work a lot of hours during tax season, and even right now coming into a deadline for individuals the 15th of this month. And But invariably, spring break uh, happens during tax season for me. I'm not able to go on spring break because I have many clients call me from Hawaii and otherwise and wonder if their tax returns are done. and I'm pretty frustrated when I'm sitting there looking out the snow out of my window and working all hours. But, you know, so I would say it's a blend. And, and similar to Mark, you take advantage of those times during the off season when you're not as busy. But knowing your family knows and learns to, to do some things without you. But at the same time, I think they're able to enjoy you more when you are available and, and you're able to do things that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And I would echo both of their sentiments. Um, from an industry perspective, you still live by the calendar. You have, you know, quarterly closes, month-end closes, half-year, year reporting. And there's just some times where you're going to be there till midnight and you're going to miss the 4th of July because that happens to be your half-year reporting deadline. So, and then there's, like they said, times in the middle of the month where you might not be as busy and you're able to get away. But I, I would say it's very much balancing the shift between that because it's never going to be, I'm home every day at five on the dot. It just doesn't happen. And I think as a young professional, it's not a good tone to set with your boss that you say, well, it's five o'clock. I mean, I see we have all this stuff to do, but I've got to go because I got to go home and, you know, pet my dog or play with my kids as a as a young person starting out that's that's probably not a good tone to set with your boss especially when they're still working so I would say as a young person in your career look at who's successful in the company you're working in or the firm that you're working in and emulate their work ethic because 
you don't want to be leaving before your boss, especially when there's lots going on. So I would say be smart enough to pick up those cues and take note of when is an appropriate time for me to have my personal balance and when is an appropriate time for me to kick in and do a little extra because we've got a deadline or we have an audit due or we have our half year report pack due. Yeah, I would just say it's it's kind of like school, right? School ebbs and flows. You got finals week, your head's down, you're working on your finals. You have a big group project, you're working on your group project. Uh, work is no different. There's times where it ebbs and flows and where it just makes sense that you need to be at work. You can't say, hey, it's, you know, grandma's uh, birthday party or not, not even her birthday party. It's just grandma's having dinner tonight and it's 4.30, can I go? I know the deadline's tomorrow, but you know, I haven't seen grandma since last week and I really wanna, wanna go see her again tonight. So uh, I would say when, when you're young and early on, um, probably the biggest thing is you wanna build trust. And the quicker you can build that trust, the more flexibility that comes. Cause I'm, I'm a big believer in having to do uh, wanting to do things uh, with your family and on the side. And some people try and say busy season's this black hole and you don't get to do anything. I really don't subscribe to that thought. Uh, I've always coached my boys, um, my kids in basketball, and I've run practices um, two nights a week and coached them three or four, um, two or three games a week throughout busy season um, ever since they could play. So that's going on seven or eight years. I was able to progress through the firm and make partner during that time. And I think really the main thing that allowed me to do that is just recognizing every now and again, I couldn't make every single game, but I, but I probably made about 90% of them. Uh, it's just knowing that, hey, if I get assigned something, I'm going to get it done. If I left at 7 o'clock to go to that one-hour game, well, I made the sacrifice that maybe I had to stay up a little later and get that assignment done and have it turned in in the morning. Uh, but it's always letting letting your boss know or your your supervisor know what your expectation is, and then you just constantly being able to deliver. And as you're able to deliver, um, you know, people stop asking you, oh, he's – He's leaving. What's he doing? Here goes another, you know, another area where I'm going to have to fill in the gaps. They knew that if I ever left, they wouldn't have to fill in the gaps for me. So I think that's that's key early on as you're trying to get that work life balance is just earn it, earn it early on. Um, so people won't know that you're not going to let them down. All right. I think that's all the time we have. We appreciate uh, these guys for appearing on Gapland show today. And uh, mm -hmm. We'd like to thank you students uh, for being here and also the Huntsman School for putting this on. So if we could have another round of applause for our panelists, we really appreciate that.